Musical coding can be a really powerful medium of creation. Uh, not only can it help facilitate new forms of musical expression, but it can be very useful in an educational context as well. So in recent years in the United States, there's been a big push for STEAM education, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And the general idea has been to teach the STEM skills with artistic applications, both to make it more approachable and to um, encourage more open-ended and exploratory ways of thinking. And so collaboration is a key component of both of these, uh, music and education, and EarSketch sits at the nexus of these. So EarSketch is a programming education tool being developed at Georgia Tech. Uh, it's an in-browser IDE for Python and JavaScript. Uh, we've built an API that lets students organize audio samples, whether it be loops or one-shots, in a DAW window in the browser. They can add effects on the tracks or on the master, all built on top of uh, web audio. And it's aimed at high school students. We have a curriculum we've developed that aligns with uh, US computer science education standards. And it's used by about 15 to 20,000 students per month. And so as we were in the process of developing it out, your sketch and testing in classrooms, one of the biggest requests we got was to simply allow students to share code with each other for group work or with the teacher for submissions. So this was sort of the first round of collaboration features we developed. You know, you could simply share an ear sketch link as a script, uh, or you could send it directly uh, to uh, another account. You could either snapshot the script if you had a submission, so it's kind of pinpointed at that time, or just a reference to the most recent version of the script. But we were also interested in real-time collaboration. So thinking about real-time collaboration in code, we always sort of had live coding in mind. Um, EarSketch supports live coding to a limited extent. If you've got a song playing and you make some changes and compile a new script, it'll sort of hot swap in the new version without stopping or changing the playhead. And so we looked at the normal general purpose programming collaborative editors like CodeBunk or FirePad. Um, and these are interesting, but you know, they mainly just supported uh, kind of ASCII or Unicode textual output. So we were also looking at musical collaborative coding editors like Troop, which is a local area network-based editor. There's a sort of client app that handles the collaborative editing. But then when you go to execute code, uh, it all runs on a server node and handles the musical synchronization. There's also Estuary and Jibber, which are browser-based uh, editors that let you collaborate over a wide area network. But for client-to-client -client synchronization in a browser-based environment, that can be kind of tricky for sort of uh, co-located playback. So the two main challenges we had in mind when we were looking to implement this was elaborating, um, implementing the collaborative text editing and then this client-to-client -client synchronization. And so one of the main contexts of use we had in mind for collaborative editing was in the classroom. We were hoping it could uh, bring a lot more interactivity to the classroom experience. For example, if a teacher is lecturing off of an ear sketch script rather than sort of like a normal slides, uh, the teacher could sort of, you know, essentially call students to the chalkboard in a sense, have them implement functions or do exercise right in the code. You could go over it in real time. Uh, we also thought it could help with in-class group work. You could have multiple people editing at the same time. You don't have to deal with, you know, sending files back and forth or dealing with version control systems or even more mundane things such as, you know, if there's not enough laptops in the classroom or if there's kind of like an unwieldy arrangement can sort of just help students uh, work together like around a table more easily. Also, if uh, a teacher is lecturing off of an ear sketch script, the students can kind of read non-linearly, look forward and back, and sort of follow along the lecture at their own pace. And then we're also thinking about the remote context, sort of the most uh, obvious feature being, you know, the same type of pair programming or group, group coding you do in the classroom, you can do remotely as well. But also in the non-real-time scenario. So ear sketch uh, takes a snapshot of your script every time you run it or save it. So you can look at the diffs as your script evolves over time. And this is true of the collaborative coded scripts as well. So then a script kind of becomes a, almost like a metaphor, like a virtual room where if you're doing group work, the artifacts of your work are there. So you can see sort of what other students have done if you're all working on a script together at different times. And even if you're working on a script and someone else opens it up, we'll send a push notification so it can help spur the real-time collaboration without any planning. But in the end, your sketch is about music, so you want to let people jam. So for implementing uh, this sort of client-to-client -client synchronization, there are two steps. First, every browser would coordinate its time with our server using NTP, our network time protocol. And then with this uh, coordinated time stream, 
all of like the play events would be quantized to a beat. And then that beat is just determined by the tempo of the script you're playing. So essentially, every your sketch script playing at a certain tempo would be locked into the same grid. And so with this in mind, we kind of wanted to just test out the affordances of the interface, look at the strengths and weaknesses of the interface for sort of larger ensemble performance. So we got, for an informal study, we got 10 master's students from the Georgia Tech Computer Music Pro Program and started testing out some performance configurations. So the first layout was pretty simple. You know, one script shared with 10 people, no formal constraints, everyone can kind of do as they please. Uh, and it was interesting in that you, know, you had all of the visual information, you can see all 10 cursors moving, all the script changing, you have the DAW view, you can see the song you're collaboratively building, but it was a little bit too chaotic to sort of formulate any sort of informed musical response. Stuff is changing too quickly for you to really kind of like look at one person's code and see what they're doing and then make the connection uh, to the sounds that are playing. Uh, because 10 people are editing a single script at the same time, if you want to run your code, what would often happen is that you know, it's sort of in an incompilable state with sort of incomplete lines being written. And then also, because people are compiling at different times, you also had a sort of fragmentation of what sounds are playing across different people's computer. The sort of original hope had been, you know, all 10 of these computers will be playing the same song at the same time, but that very quickly devolved to not be the case. And so the next format we tried out was much more constrained. Again, one script shared among 10 users, but each person can only uh, in sort of write the music for one track. And then as far as their playback is concerned, they're soloing their track and then playing back out. And so this was much more easy to parse from a musical perspective. People are actually kind of like sitting, thinking, listening, and responding to each other. Uh, one surprising drawback is, you know, we're playing in a large room with not the best acoustics. So it actually started to become hard to hear what other people are playing across from you. So the kind of interaction wasn't as a whole group, but you'd have sort of people locally listening to each other. And then the third layout we tested was the attempt was sort of a best of both worlds. You know, you have three scripts. The students can sort of move between them and play in whatever musical room they want. The idea was to sort of minimize the visual complexity and churn, but to still give people the freedom to sort of affect multiple musical voices whenever they wanted. Um, the results were mixed. Uh, you, it was easier to sort of follow what was going along in the code, but because we had three different scripts, the sort of time fragmentation was even worse. So it was actually really hard to see what was happening unless you're sort of strictly trying to listen for what one person is doing and looking at their code and making the connection. And so our future work in this kind of collaboration area is going to be focused along two lines. Uh, one line is looking at interactive notebooks and sort of thinking about how that format can affect education or what kind of performance uh, features it'll suggest for EarSketch. And then we're also looking at uh, computer collaboration, whether it's something like intelligent autocomplete or syntax suggestions, or even sort of looking at what samples you've used in your script and suggesting you know, musically compatible samples as well. And then I just want to take a minute to thank our sponsors. Uh, we received funding from the NSF, uh, the Arthur and Blank, Ruth L. Siegel, and Scott Hodges Family Foundation, and Google Tide Foundation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Avnish. We've got a question from uh, Jan. We've got a bit of time, so okay, cool. feel free to explore this in, in a little bit of detail if you want to. Yeah. Uh, Jan's asking, if you used a library for the operational transformation algorithm, you can tell I know what I'm talking about, uh, for syncing yeah. the clients up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if so, which one, and did it work well? And if not, uh, what was it like sort of writing your own? Yeah. So uh, one of my co-authors, Takahiko Tsukiya, he was the one who implemented it. Uh, he did not use OTJS. Uh, he just kind of said it didn't sort of exactly work for what it needed. So he did implement it effectively from scratch. Big job? What? A big job? Yeah, it took up quite a while. <laughs> and is that something that you've open sourced as part of this project? We are aiming use? to open source this, yes. But we're still we're in the process of now like clean, cleaning everything up and making it secure and uh, putting out the source. Mm -hmm. This one, feel free to say no, but someone said, we've got a little bit of time. Can we see a demo? Yes. <laughs> Let's try that. Cool. Yeah. 
cool, yeah, I'm weird. So this is your sketch. This is actually a piece I wrote as part of my coursework. So you've got the DAW window. You've got a sample library here. Oh, whoops, I'm not plugged in. Let's bring this down. So you can do track automation programmatically. Um, you can, whatever audio samples you have, you can also kind of slice them and use whatever segments you want. Uh, you can upload your own samples just as files. We also have integration with Freesound, so you can kind of search Freesound for whatever samples you want and bring them into your project. Um, the sidebar here actually has the whole sort of ear sketch textbook and multimedia curriculum. Russ deserves a round of applause, I think. Thank you. <laughs> live, impromptu live demo. Anything could have happened.